Kia ora, good morning and welcome to part three of my Live in Lockdown mini Namba series. It's really exciting to be back here again. This is seriously the best way for me to start my day. So while I do hope that you guys are enjoying this, uh, please know that really it's mostly for me. It gets me up, it gets me motivated for the day um, and it gets me um, kicking off each of my lockdown days in a way that are slightly more healthier and full of energy than they otherwise might be. So thank you for indulging me and coming along to listen to me every morning. I appreciate it very much. Now, who's had their breakfast this morning? Write in the comments, please. If you've had your breakfast, I'd like to know and what you have. Now, I haven't. Uh, I'm coffee, though. I'm coffeeed in. And that's really important for you guys, because if I haven't had my coffee, um, I'm significantly less lucid. And my children can attest to that. So um, lockdown day, um, question mark. What's been going on here? There was a large puzzle completed yesterday. Uh, I'd like to say that I was part of that process. Uh, instead, I was providing um, moral support whilst napping in the window seat. <laughs> so um, well done, the rest of my family, for completing a large puzzle. Uh, there's been a bit of baking activity going on. Again, that's not me. Uh, that's my teenage daughter who seems to get this urge to bake late at night. So um, the house is filling up with, I think this morning it's chocolate cake, uh, which is great. Uh, seeing you in the comments here, Wendy's on the wheat bix Love it. Classic Kiwi. Uh, Katrina's not had her breakfast yet, so hopefully your blood sugar can sustain you throughout this broadcast. And if it can't, you know, you're welcome to snack as you go. Um, David's dialing in from Sunny Nelson. Nice. And everybody is fed and at work. Look at you. You are nailing lockdown, David. I love it. I did notice as I came into my office that it's sunny on one side of my house and it's cloudy on the other. And because I don't really understand how weather works, I'm not sure what that means. I'm not sure which one's about to win. Um, does that mean it's getting cloudy or the clouds are going? I couldn't tell you. A uh, bunch of people just straight into the coffee, love that. Um, I did read an article a couple of years ago that suggested that it's really dangerous for us to drink coffee in the first 90 minutes after we wake up because it teaches um, our system to rely on coffee to wake up when really we should be at our most alert. So we should always delay drinking coffee until 90 minutes after we woke up. Uh, and there have been kind of small periods in my life where I've felt like a well-being queen and done that but for the most part I'm going to need my coffee as soon as I wake up thank you and you can take your well-meaning well-being and you can put it over there because this woman requires caffeine <laughs> so look this is part three um, of our five-part mini not an MBA series you remember in day one uh, we talked about flexibility which sits at the core of being an effective leader, of being a strategic leader, and I think of just being a person that feels all right. Yeah, so if we can't continue to cope and rebalance as the world around us goes nuts, we're going to find it really hard because the world around us is going to keep going nuts, right? Always has, always will. And sure, the pandemic will finish, and then there'll be another thing, and another thing, because this is the beauty of it. So if we don't have the capacity to cope with change in a way that allows us to continue to grow, which is what flexibility does, um, we're doing ourselves a disservice. So remember, flexibility was day one. Now, day two, we talked about decisions, which is the first of our four key capabilities. Uh, decisions are all about how we think rather than what we think. And it's worth saying that while I did take a stab at the traditional university model in terms of cramming us full of knowledge and value being in information, that doesn't mean for a second that I don't have tremendous faith in the value of university and tertiary education. And I mean that on a really deeply personal level. I just don't think it's from the accumulating of info that that value comes. So for me personally in my life, uh, university was transformative. It was a game changer. I was the first person in my immediate family to go to university. Uh, and, and I fought quite hard to get there. I had to sneak my way in. So I dropped out of school before I finished year 13. And rather than um, spending my year 13 year going to school, uh, I spent it working and pregnant with my daughter Bailey. And 
at that point, I'd actually set up my first business by the end of that year. So that's another interesting chat we can have sometime. But a friend of mine who was getting ready to go to university popped around one day with her course selection handbook because that was how you had to select your courses back then. They all came in a big book uh, and you would read through. And so I was reading through her course selection handbook and like, oh, this sounds really interesting. Oh, I'd be good at that. And so I made the decision when Bailey was about three or four months old, I'm pointing, you don't know why I'm pointing, but it's because she's asleep upstairs, <laughs> uh, that I would like to go to university too. But I didn't have year 13, which in New Zealand is the university entrance year. Uh, and so I had to find another way in. So I remember going down to the enrolment day, because again, there was no online enrolment then, it was go down and enroll uh, with my baby in a push chair and talking sweetly to some of the deans to convince them that I should be able to come to university. So um, when I was pregnant with Bailey, I um, I had this great, this great economics and accounting teacher. Um, if by any chance, Scott Haynes, you are watching, shout out to Mr. Haynes. And he provided the opportunity for his seventh form um, students to take a university level economics or accounting paper through Lincoln University uh, extramurally as a bit of a taster for uni. And so the keen year 13 students of that year would come into school a few times a week at 7 or 7.30 in the morning and they would sit down and do this university level paper. Now I dropped out of school by then as I mentioned uh, but Mr Haynes was kind enough to let me join and so I would go along um, to do this Econ 101 paper when I was pregnant with Bailey and I remember I was 30 eight weeks pregnant for the final exam so they let me do it on a um, on an ironing board and I was doing it because I couldn't sit down because my back pain and I'd gotten an A plus on that paper and so I had that in my hand at this university open day while I was convincing these deans that they should let me in to do a BA I'm like look I've done a university paper that I got in through discretionary entrance and I got an A plus so I'm clearly smart enough so you really should let me in and I'm not sure if this would work today um, but back then it did and so they did um, agree to let me in on discretionary entrance and I went to university. Um, I used to drive from Ashburton to Christchurch every day um, and my um, ex-husband was doing night shift and so he would get up at nine o'clock and look after the baby and I would jump in the car and drive to Christchurch and do my lectures and then come back in time um, for him to head off for the night shift at night and yeah, university was a transformative experience for me. I don't necessarily credit that to the information I accumulated though I credit it to um, thankfully doing an arts degree which I'm a huge fan of arts and humanities education and I'm concerned that we seem to be no longer investing in the value of that because the value of critical thinking and being able to see how history and present and future connect together and ask interesting questions right and think about society and about ideas and about why people do the things they do and how we work together. Those are extremely important skills and that's what a humanities education gives you. It's certainly what it gave me, but it also gave me insight into a world that I didn't know existed. I didn't know anybody that had had a professional career. I didn't know anybody that had been to university and realizing how much more was out there in the world, it just blew my frame of understanding wide open. And had I not gone to university, I would not have had that experience. So um, I, I went to bed last night thinking about this broadcast, I know what a nerd, and thinking about yesterday's one and thought, you know, I took a good stab at a few things about the uni model, but did I make clear how important I think that that education is? And, and I don't know that I did. So I really wanted to do that this morning. Uh, but it's a good segue because... Um, going back to my point about arts and humanities, what I found to be so valuable about studying things like political science and philosophy and history was that so much of that is about understanding how things fit together. I mean, I remember having this very basic realisation of going, oh, history's not that long ago. You know, I did, a, I did an exceptional um, second year history paper that was just World War II to now. It was just the world since 1945. And I, I remember just realizing as an 18 year old, oh, that's like, that's all quite current, <laughs> you know, because when you're 18, you're like, oh, 1945, that was basically 200 years ago. And realizing that all of that is so salient and connected was such a for me. And I think systems leadership, systems thinking is exactly the same understanding because systems aren't about what you buy, right? They're about the way things fit together. 
And I think that's a skill that is sorely lacking in the general professional population and in particular at the leadership level. Understanding the way things fit together and using that to make work work and to deliver things is really challenging. And it's not because people suck. People are great as a rule, right? But it's because we've designed these organisational um, structures and incentives and performance frameworks that actively disincentivize collaborative systems leadership. So what tends to happen is we get into the situation where, remember I talked about the traditional development trajectory on day one, and I talked about how we incentivize people to be exceptional subject matter and technical and operational experts until such time as we give them people to manage, until such time as we then pull the rug out from under them and go, oh, we need lots of other things from you now, right? Well, that's reflected in the way that we tend to construct organisations. And what happens is you've got someone who is the senior leader of a particular unit or group or section of an organisation, and they spend the majority of their time trying to run a best practice that all right, so you've got a best practice finance and corporate services department. You've got a best practice um, human resources and people and culture department. You've got a best practice operational delivery. And then those people spend one to three hours a week putting on what they call their ELT or SLT hat. Like it's a hat, right? And they put their hat on, their, their LT hat, and they go and sit in a room and sort of try to make decisions and have conversations that benefit the broader system, the entire organisation. And that's really challenging to do because even though they've got the best of intentions at the back of their mind is still thinking about making sure that they've got the necessary resources to allocate to their particular zone, right? To make sure that they're not missing out and that they're there not just with their peers, but also advocating on behalf of the interests of the people that they lead. And that creates a really murky environment at the leadership level, because while in theory we should be trying to lead from a system standpoint, there are lots of things that make that hard. Yeah, those factors make that really challenging. And so in the worst case, what happens is that we wind up with five best practice business groups, but not a well-functioning organisation. And I see this happen all the time. Five best practice business groups does not an effective organisation make. And a great analogy for this is to think about um, architecture. Yeah, So when an architect designs a house, it doesn't design nine awesome rooms. right? It designs a house. And if some of the size or quality of some of those rooms needs to be sacrificed in order to create the better house, they will be, right? Because he's not a room designer. He's a house architect. And I think... If we consider our organisations the same, yeah, sometimes we're going to have to have these particular parts suffer to benefit the whole, then that's worth doing. Then we change our mindset completely. But it's not a mindset problem. I want to just really hammer this home. It is not a mindset problem on its own. Culture and mindset are an outcome, not an input or a problem on their own, right? If the culture or the mindset is wrong, don't start talking to me about changing culture. Talk to me about nailing your strategy, setting up your systems to incentivize the correct behavior, building capability and resources and, and empowering your leadership, then talk to me about culture and mindset. And I think that that silo-based way of thinking that privileges parts rather than the whole is absolutely a systems issue. Right? It is not a leadership or a culture or a mindset issue. It's a systems issue. So we have set up an environment that is designed to produce us the results that it's giving us. right? Because all systems work as they've been designed they deliver the results we've asked them to deliver. All right. So I think that if we can start to turn the curve on that and to upskill people and leadership teams with a better understanding of connections and how things fit together and relationships between parts, we are going to go some way to changing the way that our organisations are designed. Because otherwise, we've just got all this money and time that's being wasted. Right. So I want to talk to you about the three um, key kinds of leader in the systems thinking space that I think are really helpful. And I'm going to attempt to use my flip chart, but we'll see how we go. Because I think this is a really simple illustration of the difference between systems leadership and others. Right. So I often say when it comes to system leadership, you start off down here and this is where you have what I call the hero leader. Right. 
Now, the hero leader is the guy that produces results, or maybe not the guy, the guy or the woman, who produces incredible results through sheer will and exertion alone, right? They do everything themselves. They're very, very good, but it requires a lot of their personal energy. And at the hero leadership level, nothing works without me, right? So if you are in an organizational environment where, look, you're getting a lot done, you're really good, but you know that if you don't show up for a week, things are in trouble, that if you don't swing in to save the day when it comes to meeting deadlines or ensuring quality or responding to disaster, that something is wrong, you are not a systems leader. You are a hero leader. You've got massive key person risk, right? And this is where I, um, this is where I gravitate to naturally. I'm a hero leader, right? My natural tendency is to be like, ah, watch me collect all the glory and control all the variables. And I work with a lot of people and I think it's not, you know, it's not a personality failing. If you're a highly ambitious, highly motivated person, you will often fall here, right? The next level is the people leader, right? So a lot of people manage to make it up here. And that's where you're able to diffuse some of that key person risk by spreading it amongst others, right? You're delegating. You're able to actively empower people to do parts of your job or parts of the job of that business unit um, and to do that well. And at that point, nothing works without them, right? So can you see there that we've still got key person risk? We've just kind of diversified it. And that is a lot better. You know, if, if you get hit by a bus, things are still going to continue to work. But it's still a very person-oriented model, yeah? What we want to aim for is systems leadership level. And at that point, we're saying it works, Right? So these are very person intensive, these two layers. Nothing works without me, nothing works without them. Once we get to the systems leadership level, we find that we're designing um, processes, systems, relationships, organizations that work. We've taken the people out of it. And this is a really unpopular approach in a world that is now very um, customer centric, people centric, right? We talk a lot about people centric design, people-centric leadership. And that's cool and that's great. And I'm the last person to talk to you about this because I'm like, oh, people are a pain in the ass, get them out of here. What systems leadership does is it takes people out of the equation and not by firing them or by thinking they're not important, but by considering the system um, as a series of interconnected parts, relationships and processes and assuming positive intent of all of the people who are involved. And this is really important. We assume that everybody who comes to work does the best they can and wants to do a good job. And that if that isn't happening, if something's going wrong, it's not a people issue, it's a systems issue. Right? So while this takes the people out, it does that to serve them because it says, look, if we've got performance issues or efficiency issues or delivery issues or even culture issues, Let's not point fingers at people. Let's look at the system and understand why this is happening. What have we set up that is delivering us these results? Because systems work perfectly as designed. They deliver us what they've been asked to do. So if we're getting results we don't like, let's not point fingers at people. Let's go and work out why that's happening. Right? And can you see the difference? People, people like me, everyone else, no people, right? system it works and it's a completely different way of understanding the world and it's really important that we're able to do this because otherwise we devolve into circumstances where we're pointing fingers at people i'm a huge believer in the idea that there is no such thing as a single crime i'm going to say that again there is no such thing as a single crime if you have an issue or a problem or a concern in your organization, you are not the only one experiencing that. I will, I'll guarantee it right now, right? There is no such thing as a single crime. And when we treat problems and issues as single crimes and we try and solve individual problems, we get into trouble because we exert a lot of energy and a lot of resources and we focus really narrowly on the things that we understand and that we can control. And it's just like putting out little fires here, there and everywhere but if the system that underlies that and produces those results hasn't been tinkered with, it will continue to happen. And even if you put it out in your zone, it's going to pop up somewhere else, right? 
And so what we need is for our systems to be producing us the outcomes that we're looking for. And that requires absolute clarity about what those outcomes are at the leadership level and elsewhere. And we've talked about that in the decisions component, right? We need to be really clear in our direction and how we respond, right? And then we need to be building our policies, processes, relationships, and workflows in a way that support that, even if the people involved aren't motivated, right? Because here's my real bugbear. My real bugbear is when we um, we try to change organisations on the basis of willpower and motivation and connection to purpose. And we write um, long lists of organisational values and we put them on posters and we stick them on the back of the toilet door and we're like, we are agile and collaborative and people-led and we say all these things. But the systems that run the engine of our organisation actually require us that if we want to exhibit those behaviours and values, we actually have to work against our environment, right? And so we'll be like, be collaborative. But at a very basic level, um, your performance is assessed on independent KPIs and you can't share a cost code and there's no um, allowance for non-recordable time in your in your work. And so, okay, cool, tell people to be collaborative, but if the systems in place that govern their environment are actively disincentivizing that, it's not going to work, is it? Or be agile, but also we have a three-year planning cycle that you need to submit detailed variations for if you'd like to do something different on your project. It's not very agile, is it? And so on and so forth. Right, so when we've got problems up here, we're so much better to ask questions about what's happening underneath so that we can start to get to the root of those. And that requires people having conversations together Right, And it also requires um, asking really good questions. Right, so there's a framework I like to use for this when it comes to thinking about questions. And I'm going to lay it out for you here. And I, I designed this framework around my three kids. You know, So you remember I've got a teenager, a middle child, and a, and a young kid. And so Harriet Six, uh, what's the most common question you get from, from young kids? Into the comments. There's a bit of a lag on this, so I don't always see your comments as quickly as you put them in. But the most common question you're going to have from a young child, and anyone who's had kids three, four years old will know this, is why? But why? Right? And this is the first question and the most important question that we need to be asking. Because if we understand that there's no such thing as a single crime, rather than trying to point fingers, we need to be asking why something happens. Bam. Bam. You've all got it. I love it. Um, and not just asking it once, but asking it over and over again, right? So an example I've got for this, um, and I talk about this in the book, is a government agency who had mandated the use of a particular brand of tablet, right? The technology, the IT department had said, everybody has to use Microsoft Surface Pros because that's what we use here. And we've got a great bulk deal on them and we can control the security environment for them and they're a good match. And we've gone and, you know, we've got a long contract with the supplier. Everyone has to use Microsoft Surface Pros. Do not go out and buy other technology for your staff. But everybody kept buying iPads, right? And the IT manager's going absolutely postal about it. He's like, why do people keep buying iPads, right? And they tried tightening the policy settings and they tried making it difficult to approve, but people were still going around. Right, so we can go, why do people keep buying iPads? And the immediate default response in those situations is to point fingers at people and to punish their behaviour, right? But what we did instead was we went through it, and what we want to aim for here is a minimum of three whys, yeah, and, a and we want to be get getting to five if we can. Why do people keep buying iPads? And the really easy response initially was because Surface Pros didn't support a really important program that field engineers needed to do their job. They couldn't put that program on their surface, so they weren't using it. And we could just stop there and go, well, that makes sense. Okay, fine. Uh, we've got a policy exclusion. If you need that app, then, then you can have an iPad. But we don't want to do that, right? We want to keep asking. So we want to go, all right, well, why have we ended up in a situation where our mandated technology doesn't support a really key business need? Well, because health and safety legislation changed um, and we didn't account for that when we did the technology strategy. 
Ah, oh, okay. Well, maybe the answer there would be to make sure that we've got a better, um, you know, environment scanning process as part of our strategy development. Mm. No, let's dig down again. Why did our long-term technology strategy not involve key parts of the business that could have told us <laughs> that we had these changes coming, right? Why, why did this happen? Well, because we don't actually have um, a consultation and engagement process mandated as part of our strategy development in IT. And, um, and we're also under the pump that just getting the strategy done, late as it was, was, the, um, was an absolute feat. You know, we're really proud of getting it done. And if we'd taken the time to go and try and run workshops everywhere else, A, nobody would have come. Uh, and B, it would have pushed the whole thing out even longer. So, you know, what's the incentive for us to do that? my performance is measured on the basis of delivering the strategy, not on how good I mates I am with the field engineers. Hmm. Okay, well, there's a problem in there as part of our development process. But we want to ask why again. So hang on, why? Why is it so difficult for us to do collaborative stuff here? Why don't we have the space for that? Why would nobody turn up to the workshops? Well, because the way that our performance is um, managed and reported is based on quarterly incentives, and it's based on individual delivery and it's based on short-term cost recovery, right? And we can follow those whys in so many directions. Like why did we um, why did we box ourselves into such a long-term contract? Because it was the cheapest and that's what and that's what we're looking for. Or, you know, why don't people come to workshops? Because their managers don't allow them to spend time on organisation-wide initiatives because they're already at 110% capacity doing their own delivery. Like there are so many different questions there. And all of a sudden we've gone from, why do people keep buying iPads? God, they're such assholes. To what is it about the way this place is currently designed and running that's delivering us outcomes that don't make sense, right? So the first and most important question of any systems leader is why. This is my little kid question. Middle question is, middle child, right, so she, I think when I put this framework together was nine, she's 11 now, so what, right, it's a little bit of belligerence in there, so what, so as well as interrogating root causes, we need to be interrogating um, consequences as well, because not every problem needs solving, and understanding exactly what the problem is, um, is really important, and that sounds really basic, but I think often we don't actually understand what's motivating us to solve a problem in the first place, Right. So in the in the case of the iPads, we're like, well, why is it a problem? So what? So what if people are buying iPads? What's well, not good? Because we need consistency. Hmm. Hold on. Consistency is a pretty mediocre goal. So what? So what if we don't have consistency? Who cares? Well, then, you know, we're wasting a whole bunch of money and we're a public agency and it's really important for us to deliver, you know, value across the full life cycle and we can't be wasting taxpayer money. Okay, well, that's pretty good. Um, but is it true that, the, that that's the only way for us to, to design those contracts? What are we really afraid of? Oh, well, it's a security issue. You know, we can't control the security environments on the iPads the same as we can on the Surface Pro. Okay, and why does that matter? Well, because we deal with a lot of really sensitive information, and if we can't keep people's personal information um, safe, then we're not doing our, again, our duty as a public agency. Okay. So the actual effects that we're trying to control are around privacy and safety and cost effectiveness. Is that right? Yes. Okay. That changes the way we design solutions rather than just consistency. It was worth going down that track. Yeah. And the third question that we ask, so we first we always ask why. Why and why and why and why and why. Second question, so what? What are the consequences here? Is this a problem we need to solve? And what is the actual problem we're trying to solve? And the third question is courtesy of my teenager, and this one has to be said with a particularly um, dubious inflection. So this one is, is it though? And for those of you who can't understand a Kiwi accent, that was, is it though? Okay, and this is about interrogating assumptions. This is about making sure that things are actually a problem and that we don't have large assumptions that are sitting underneath the way we solve problems and design organizations and systems that are holding us back. Because we had a whole bunch of assumptions in there, right? Because one of our so what's in this particular case was that it was really challenging for the people in IT to then be troubleshooting with people who'd bought iPads, 
right? Because they'd ring up and be like, oh, my iPad's not working and I can't get the thing to go on the thing. Um, and they don't have the time, the bandwidth and the knowledge to troubleshoot that particular piece of technology because they'd been focusing on the one that they'd mandated, right? And so one of the key issues as expressed by this place was, you know, it's creating a real um, backlog for us in terms of providing IT support. And I remember having the conversation where we just unearthed that assumption and went, well, is it actually IT's job to be providing that kind of support though? Like, oh, aren't you guys actually supposed to be the centre of excellence for the organisation in terms of setting the information and technology direction? Is it appropriate for you to be having technical support or should that be outsourced or should that be managed differently? And then, bing, right, that's an assumption that had sat underneath that that we didn't need. And there was a whole bunch more of those as we went through. And so if we'd taken our surface problem, which is just that people keep buying iPads, God, they're assholes, how do we make it harder and harder for people to buy iPads? What would have happened was we would have tightened the policy settings and people would have still actively worked around it. Because here's the thing about systems. People do the right thing if it's the easiest thing to do. And if it's not the easiest thing to do, they won't do it, right? Because we don't want to build systems that rely on people's willpower, actively fighting against something. We want it to just work. It's not that it depends on us. It's not that it depends on them. It needs to just work. And if you can't make the right thing the easiest thing, it's probably not the right thing. It's actually a really simple test. Is the right thing the easy thing? No. People have to go through, all, jump through all these hoops to get there. Okay, well, let's change that. Are people doing it now? No. Uh probably not the right thing then. All right, challenge all of those assumptions. So again, I can talk about this all day. <laughs> I can talk about systems thinking for you all day. Um, and I think that we um, we totally overcomplicate this one and we make it all very full of diagrams and everything else. But from, an, from a very basic leadership organizational point of view, systems thinking is about the way things fit together and finding ways to design an environment that sets us up to deliver what we want to deliver, that makes that easy, that takes the people out of it, right? that doesn't point fingers and blame when things go wrong and doesn't require people to be superhuman or heroes or have amazing willpower or fight against something to do what we've asked them to do. right? It's about designing an environment that makes our strategy as easy as possible to deliver. And that means tweaking the way things work, right? tweaking incentives, tweaking consequences improving relationships, creating space for it, zooming out and going, well, there's no such thing as a single crime. So how do all these things fit together? What is it about these relationships that's currently broken and how do we fix that? And that should be the job of a leadership team, not putting a hat on and coming to sit together, and not actual hats, but I often think when someone goes, I'm just putting on my SLT hat here, I often like to imagine what the hat would look like. It's not putting your hat on and sitting together for two hours a week and fighting for budget. It's sitting in a room going, all right, guys, here's something I've been noticing. You guys noticing that too? Yeah, actually, we've got a bit of that, right? And having organizational design conversations that are able to unpick those complex systems and go, oh, well, because we have the power and the perspective, <laughs> which is the value of having a leadership team in the first place, let's change this environment to stop this problem. Yeah, because that's why we have a leadership team so that they can make decisions that benefit the entire organization. And if you are on a leadership team, let's be very clear, those people are your peers. It's not something you put a hat on for, that's your team. The people you lead are not your team. Your leadership team is your team. Those are your peers. They're the people that you make decisions with to benefit the entire system, to build a great house. Stop building a great room, start building a great house. All right, everyone, we have come to the end of this morning's live. Got a bit ranty. Sorry about that. Get a bit ranty on systems. I could do this one all day. Uh, let's get you in the comments telling me what your key takeaway is today. What's the thing that you heard that made you go, oh, and you want to write it down now before you forget the line, and then you're not able to pull it out when you go on a rant on a team Zoom call later today. Because if I can achieve at least one of you out there putting your finger up in a team Zoom or a Teams call today and going, hmm, is it though? Or, yeah, look, I, I don't think it's as easy as that. 
I want to have a I want to have a systems conversation. If I am able to achieve one of you doing that today, then this life has been worth it for me. <laughs> I will be a happy human. All right, people do the right thing if it's the easiest thing to do, says Linda. Absolutely, they do. Right. So let's assume people are great. Let's assume positive intent and go well. If they're not doing it, something else is going on. It's not their fault. You know what? Every now and again it is, but it's very rarely that. Right. So how do we design our system to be different? Right. Ed loves the three questions. Why? So what? And is it though? Cause, effect, assumptions. Bam. I love that. Haley also loving the questions. Right. And I've got um, I've got clients that put those on a post-it note and stick it on their monitor. Right. Just to remember to ask them occasionally. Because the reason that we don't ask great questions, again, remember systems thinking takes the people blame out of it. It isn't because we suck or we're dumb. It's just because we're under so much operational pressure that just keeping up is really challenging. And so to create the space to ask good questions is hard and we need reminders to do that. So let's pick a system that helps us to do that, right? And Wendy's all about that. Never blame the people, blame the system. How good is that? Joe's taking the architect uh, analogy along with her. Hang on, stop building a great room, start building a great house. <laughs> totally, it's a good one, right? Uh, Dion the same yeah I've always remembered that one since I've heard it yeah cool what has been set up that's delivering this result systems work as they're designed right what is it that we have established that is delivering us this outcome that we don't want yeah you guys are doing great um we've got culture and mindset as an outcome yeah um there's an article that I'll link to in the comments of this stream um that I wrote after I had a big stab at restructures last year, which outlines my Mackay hierarchy of organizational effectiveness that shows that really clearly where culture and mindset are at the top as an outcome and what sits underneath that. So I'll link that in the comments if you guys want to have another look at that. Awesome. And David's going to go and share this <laughs> so that we're all on the same page because he wants other people to know about this too. And I love that. And that goes for all of you. If you've been watching along this week or just today and you're like, oh, it's not me that needs to know this. I'm great. It's everyone else that's the problem. <sighs> Understand that thinking. Tag them in. Be like, watch this. Let's have a chat about it at our team meeting on Friday. This is helpful, right? All right. You guys have been tremendous as always. I have been blown away every day that I've done these by the quality of engagement and comments that I've been having on this stream, right? The amount of people really taking the space to think differently and to provide um, their own commentary and links and to serve others in the comments is really heartwarming. You guys rock. This is a really good indicator of um, what happens when people are at their lockdown best. Um, so you guys rock, have an awesome day and I will see you back here at nine o'clock tomorrow talking to you about, drum roll please, performance, how we get shit done, right? And if that sounds like you, I will see you in the morning. Kakita everyone, have a great lockdown day, see you tomorrow.